I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode of The Treehouse Show, we'll be talking about jQuery releases, favicons, and CSS optimization. Let's check it out. First up is Easing Functions. It's this really cool website at easings.net where you can learn about all the different types of easing functions that you can apply to animations. Now, what is an easing function? Well, it's a little bit complicated to think about if you've never encountered them before, but basically you use them with CSS animations and transitions, um, and you can also use them in JavaScript as well. It basically determines how fast an animation plays over time not necessarily quantifying time itself. So the animation could play over four seconds or 10 minutes, and it determines how fast the animation occurs. This is pretty complicated, which is why there's this whole website for it. So if you want to say, create an animation that is ease in cubic, which kind of increases in speed over time, you can go ahead and click on this, and it will show you how to implement that in JavaScript, SAS, as well as CSS. So it would look something like this, which is pretty complicated to just go ahead and do in pure numbers, which is why it's nice to have this little graph here. So pretty nifty. All of these different possible easing functions would make great Twitter screen names, by the way, or BT dubs, as the kids say. I will consider that. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, no problem. Next up, we have some new releases of jQuery. Uh, jQuery 1.9 and 2.0 uh, have recently come out. jQuery 1.9 is the next evolution of jQuery. This includes support for older versions of Internet Explorer 6, 7, and 8. jQuery 2.0 is dropping support for those older versions of IE in order to have a smaller, more modular code base. Uh, but kind of the big news about this jQuery release is the jQuery Migrate plugin, which can be used with either jQuery 1.9 or 2.0 to detect deprecated and removed features. So if you do plan on upgrading a jQuery 1.8 site to 1.9 or 2.0, make sure you test out with this Migrate plugin on your site locally, and then just get an idea of what features you may be using. And um, this is useful because even if you're using a plugin that uses these features, it'll tell you. So that's something that you'll have to watch out for on your own sites. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. That's exactly what, what I was going to ask, if it can look at plugins and also tell you if they're still compatible. Yeah, because you can only control the code that you write. That's right. So uh, that's really amazing because it, it makes upgrading so easy. There's, there's really no excuse unless you are really using those deprecated features. Yeah, exactly. Right. But and I could probably come up with a few good excuses to not upgrade. Yeah, laziness, yeah. procrastination. Don't, don't feel like it. Yeah, uh, uh, those are all good reasons for anything, really. Next up, we're going to talk about uh, Mackie icons or Mackay icons. I'm not Ma really Ma sure how to, Mackie? I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Uh, this is a really nice icon set for pixel perfect web cartography. So let's say you're making the next four square or some sort of cool mapping application. Call it five square. Yeah, five square. That's genius. Or rec five tangle. That's right. Uh, and you want to go ahead and drop in these really nice little bits of iconography. Well, that's exactly what this icon set is for. You can drop in gas stations or bus stops or theaters or coffee. Or minefield. Exactly. That's good to know, too. Yeah. And it comes in three different sizes, 24 pixels, 18, and 12. And you'll notice as we scale down, the look of the iconography actually changes slightly. It doesn't just scale down the pixel sizes, it actually changes what the icon looks like, which is important because at smaller sizes, icons don't necessarily scale smoothly. You want to really get into pixel perfection when you're doing that type of thing. Um, this is, of course, open source, available on GitHub, and you should definitely check it out if you're planning on making applications that deal with mapping. Do you have any idea for a new mapping application, Nick? I do. It's called Unexpected Coffee. You basically go to places that are not coffee shops and try to find really, really good coffee there. So I'm talking about fast food restaurants, you know, 
public libraries, office buildings that you're not authorized to be in. So, you know. you, so basically a user would submit a random location to your app, unexpected right. coffee. And then you'd go there and you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is the best coffee ever. Why don't they have this at Starbucks? I feel like that could be a really good opportunity for pranks. Like, I would definitely vote up a, a friend's house. Yeah. Cool. That so, one's for free. Yeah. Look out for that one, Jarrett. Next up, we have a project called Parsley.js. This is JavaScript form validation. It's powerful, UX aware, and dead simple. So this uh, makes you not have to write JavaScript anymore to validate your forms on the front end. So we can see some examples here. If you have a, a demo, here's a name field. And all you have to do is put in a couple of attributes to say that something is, for example, required. Uh, when you want to trigger these validations, it could be on the change event. This is an example on the email field. Say, A it something. Well, hey, that's not valid. It says, hey, this should be a valid email. Now, the nice thing about Parsley.js is it has a ton of different options, and it is also super easy to install. You just include the Parsley JavaScript on your site, and then add the different data attributes to it, and you are good to go. There's a ton of different validations that it has on its site, and you can find a link to that in our show notes at youtube.com slash gotreehouse. I really like how you can include Parsley in your website. I feel like really every JavaScript framework and, and, and stuff should be named after foods. So it's kind of just like cooking. You know, you throw in some parsley, yeah. you throw in some tomatoes or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get a little website ratatouille going. There's a 2013 trend for you. Next up, we're going to talk about this really cool blog post from Jonathan T. Neal called Understanding the Favicon, or Fave Icon, if you will. And much like Jonathan, I found the same thing when I was reading his article. He said, when I decided to dive in a little deeper, things got interesting, and I realized how little I knew about favorite icons, touch icons, and tile icons. Uh, one of the things I learned by reading this article is that these were actually introduced in 1999 for Internet Explorer. I feel a little silly not having known that, but... Internet Explorer has been driving the web forward uh, since 1999. Evidently. So that's why their, their ICO files, I guess, uh, it's a relic of the Windows desktop. Um, I also learned that the type attribute is basically useless. And I also learned that if you want to implement a high DPI icon, it's actually a little messy if you want to go ahead and support all of the different browsers using an ICO file and also using a PNG file. The code for it is down here at the bottom. And of course, there's other little caveats that are covered in the article, but really, really interesting read. And I think it's something that is definitely worth learning about because there's just such a huge multitude of devices. And of course, there are now also high resolution displays that you should be concerned with. So pretty nifty. Next up, we have a project called basket.js. Now, this isn't completely ready for full time. This is a project by Adi Asmani. It's uh, a beta. And what it does is, you know, if you've used a CDN before to kind of cache JavaScript or get a JavaScript file to load quicker, well, what basket.js does is it uses local storage in a browser to cache uh, external JavaScripts inside of the browser using the HTML5 local storage. This way, if you go to a site where a script is used that is already in local storage, instead of going out to fetch it, it'll just pull it up inside of your browser and load that much quicker. If the script does not exist inside of local storage, it will go out and fetch that using an AJAX request, save it to local storage, and load it up on the page. This winds up being pretty quick. Uh, now, it's a very, very simple API. It just has a few different methods, basket.require, get, remove, and clear. Um, so check this out. You know, like I said, it's still in beta, not quite ready for prime time, but a very interesting concept, and it kind of shows, you know, where we're going to be going with uh, HTML5 and local storage. Pretty cool. Next up is this really cool article about using the HTML title attribute. Now, similar to the Favicon article. This has a lot of really interesting things that I never really thought much about. Just kind of use the title attribute and uh, didn't really think much of it. 
Basically, the title attribute is only useful to people that are using a mouse, which, as it turns out, is actually less and less people uh, in recent times because there's mobile users, tablet users, uh, users that use assistive devices, and then a lot of users that just use the keyboard and kind of navigate the web that way. Um, the title attribute is only useful if you actually hover over something that has a title attribute on it. So you'd go ahead and hover your mouse over it and you'd see some sort of text appear. So, so for example, if you're a fan of the comic XKCD, you can go ahead and hover over each comic and something, you know, some bit of ancillary text will come up. Um, this is interesting to me because everyone talks about the, the hover pseudo class in CSS not being useful for assistive devices or being useful for, uh, say, tablet or mobile users, but the same is true for the title attribute. So in this article, they list uh, a couple of places where it actually is useful, so labeling frame or iframe elements or providing a programmatically associated label for a control in situations where a visible text label would be redundant, so useful in forms. And then there's a much longer list of places where it's actually not useful or not totally supported. So pretty cool article, well worth reading for anyone that is interested in HTML, which is... Everybody. Basically everybody. The entire world is interested in HTML. You should be. Even if they don't know it. Uh, next up, kind of to go along with that, actually not really, there's a project called MinCSS, or Minces, not really sure how to pronounce it. So this, uh, quote, clears the junk out of your CSS. You guys couldn't see that, but I was doing air quotes when I said that. So uh, what this does is it's a tool, you give it a URL or a couple URLs, it downloads all of the CSS, and then it checks every single selector in your CSS to find out which ones aren't used. From there, you can go through and delete these selectors from your CSS files and, you know, trim down your pages. Uh, on an example page that this author tried, he went from 82 kilobytes down to 7 kilobytes. So this is quite, you know, quite a bit of savings. Now, you probably don't want to just use this on a single page on your site and then just delete all of your CSS. You know, use it, compare the output on a bunch of different pages, and see where you really can slim down all your different CSS. So I'm, I'm really appreciating this trend of, of, of food, uh, food names. Hmm. So you can, you know, you can use minces, min, mince your parsley. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, maybe throw in chef. I mean, there, there's all sorts of terms coming up. I'm telling you, it's a, it's, it's a new trend. Yeah, we're the web design salad. That's right. That's what we're going to call it. Web design salad. So I think that about wraps it up for today. If you want to catch us on Twitter, I am Jay Cipher. I'm at Nick RP. Uh, thanks so much for watching this episode of The Treehouse Show. For show notes and more, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash go treehouse. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one and learn more about web design, web development, mobile development, business, and more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. See you next week. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.